everyone, and welcome to Epilepsy Stories. My name is Robert Fiore, the Connecticut Epilepsy Advocate. Our guest today is Dr. Julie Pan from Yale University, and she's here to speak about metabolic imaging and other facets of epilepsy. Welcome, Dr. Julie Pan. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us. That is the first thing we'd like to speak about, metabolic imaging. Could you please tell our guests all about it and how it helps people with epilepsy and how you look at people with epilepsy with this? Yeah. Um, there are many aspects to uh, ways to evaluate epilepsy, and the most conventional way that all of our patients know is structural MRI. Um, but a lot of times what we're looking for is actually how the brain functions. It's not simply a problem of structure. It can look perfectly fine, but it, it's clearly not working fine, and that's where a lot of seizures unfortunately arise in situations where the regular structural MRI looks completely normal. Um, and so we are looking, we have always been looking for new sensitive functional ways to look at how the brain works, identify where seizures are coming from, better understand um, the, the lay of the land, if you will, in terms of what's causing seizures, where do seizures propagate, um, and uh, so that t helps us a lot in terms of better being able to classify, monitor, and therefore manage uh, epilepsy. Um, Functional imaging comes in many, many different flavors. Uh, the most common form that people know of is probably FDG fluorodeoxyglucose PET. Um, the ones that I am, uh, and that's a very, it's a very commonly used method. Um, there's also other methods, and the ones that I know a good deal about is MR, magnetic resonance functional imaging. And even there, there's multiple ver flavors, if you will. Well, why not elaborate on one of those, please? Yeah. Um, what we do in our, in our facilities actually look at the biochemistry, the metabolism, of the brain as an image so that you can say where the metabolism in certain regions is normal, not quite normal, dysfunctional, etc. Um, and oftentimes that will line up with a structural abnormalities you can see on an anatomical MRI, but oftentimes it doesn't. And so um, that, again, is very, very useful when we're looking at epilepsy where a lot of the, situ a lot of the situations cases come up where the structural uh, imaging is completely normal. Now when somebody is getting this type of test, be it metabolic imaging or MRI, are you able to monitor immediately or do you have to go run the test and then look at it afterwards? Um, we typically are looking at pa imaging our patients interictly. In other words, between seizures, when they're, when they're seizure free or not having seizures at that very moment. Okay. And it turns out that our metabolic or biochemical picture, if you will, is sensitive to the brain dysfunction without having to have the actual seizure in place. And, and that's actually really good because it would be awfully difficult to actually get patients to actually have a seizure for us while you're in the magnet. Plus, it's just not a good idea to have seizures in the magnet. So, right. so um, you don't have to, you know, it's an interictal study. Just like uh, the vast majority of imaging methods, you really cannot hope to actually necessarily capture a seizure at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some that try to do that, but it, it gets to be very, very uh, costly and time consuming if you actually requiring to actually capture the image while they're having a seizure. Right, because with the process that I went through before my surgery at Yale, what they did is they lowered my medication, right. and as you're aware, there's two right. monitors there, you're hooked up, right. and they practically encourage a seizure so yeah. they can see what side of the brain that yeah. your seizures yeah. are produced. Yeah. 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 That's, uh, you know, coming into the hospital for phase, what we call it here at Yale, phase one monitoring, um, is really very, very important step in the process of better understanding any patient's epilepsy. Um, the thing about the monitoring with where you're connected up to the wires, et cetera, in the hospital is that, you know, that's really important critical information, but usually, unfortunately, the localization, the spatial regional at localization you get from that test is insufficient to actually plan surgery um, on, and so that's why all these advanced tests are necessary. Does the spectroscopic MRI show more than a conventional MRI? We think that it's shows different. It can't, I mean, when you get a spectroscopic MRI, you're obviously, we obviously do get a regular structural MRI at the same time. I mean, okay. it's, in, you know, one right after the other, so you can end up, you know, saying, in this anatomical region, I know this functional information. So it's really tightly correlated. You, you have to, you, you want to know what am I looking at in terms of structure plus function to actually be the most constructive for, for understanding any given patient. Okay. Would you mind elaborating a little more as far as with the metabolic imaging, the things you want to look for, the things you want to see, and what you do not want to see mm -hmm. to see if a person's a candidate for surgery? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, the, the most, the, 
you know, the most commonly used and, and the one that we use and, and one of the most more informative is to look at a, a compound called n aspartate which is a, uh, it's a metabolite that is uh, uh, synthesized in neuronal mitochondria and so therefore that, that relationship between um, making energy in neurons is really very, very important for the um, epileptogenic tissue. That in, epileptogenic, in the seizure onset zone the ability of those tissues to make or handle their adequate energy needs is compromised, so that um, when we use this functional test of n aspartate we can that those that compound is actually lower in the areas of of, of, of injury, um, and so that actually turns out to be very very accurate for uh, uh, identifying where the dysfunction is. So in layman's terms, that would I would understand <laughs> you're basically looking yeah. for. Yeah, it's kind of like. Um, uh, it's kind of like a, a, a power station. It is truly the power station for a city. If you if you have a small city or or a, a city that's not working too well, the power station is not big enough to handle the city's energetic needs. Right. And so that's how we see NA, NAA is a is a measure of appropriate to the size of the city, uh, appropriate to the neurons, the tissue there, that it is either able to handle the energy demands or it's not able to. And by far and away in, in healthy brain, it's at a certain amount that we anticipate is therefore able to handle the energy needs of that particular area. In the epileptic onset, epilepsy onset, seizure onset zones, we, bel we have found, and, and many people have found, that this concentration of this compound is lower, i.e. the power station is unable to make a sufficient energy to handle the immediate uh, tissues of city, quote unquote, city's needs. And so therefore, it's, that's why it's decreased, okay. It's amazing when you talk about epilepsy, uh, there always seems to be a parallel with electricity. And yes, if you, it's very if you much have too much, uh, then it could trigger a seizure. Right. If you go it's, too low. Yeah, it's a, it's a control issue. It's, it's uh, you don't want, you want enough appropriate amount of energy to handle the demands of the tissue. And sometimes what's happening with a seizure is that the demands go way out of whack compared to what it can handle, <laughs> okay, or what, yeah. what it can produce. And, um, and so the, um, the metabolic aspects to the, to the seizure itself is, uh, is a really critical part of why there's, a, 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 why there's this dysfunction in the, in the region. You and I were speaking earlier and we mentioned uh, dieting, mm -hmm. ketogenic dieting, mm -hmm. and and other types of yeah. uh, high yeah. fat dieting. Yeah. Would you mind elaborating on that, please? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that it's been known for actually eons, centuries, um, that a high fat diet makes seizures better, all right? Um, and it's been known, it's actually written in the Bible um, uh, to that effect. I mean, if you had a child that was having seizures, if you just let them in the corner you know, they, yeah. get, and let and, and not feed them. Unfortunately, I mean, obviously it's not a good situation, but their seizures no. would actually get better in that context. And we realized, or after much work has de realized that uh, the fasting process, in mm. other words, living off your stored body fat is really the same thing as, is similar, I'm saying similar to living on a high fat diet and so therefore it for some reason and there's there's not as much knowing about this as as I as we would like um, a high fat diet is well known to actually decrease seizure frequency and decrease seizure intensity uh, in in patients with epilepsy when I was about 11 years old my doctor had put on put me on a high fat high protein diet yeah. and it helped a great deal yeah. um, I still had seizures, but nothing like yeah. before I was going on that diet. Yeah. Have a friend of mine, uh, her son at the time was three years old, and she put her son on the ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. And naturally for every kid, when you tell them you have to eat X amount at X time of day, they don't want to hear it. But luckily, uh, it worked out for them. And on this uh, young man's fifth birthday, he had a pizza. <laughs> <laughs> That's that. That's a gutsy move. Yeah. I mean, the the KD, the ketogenic diet, is is well known, and it's 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 a hard diet to maintain. But it's this aspect of metabolism and and nutritional status of metabolism that has been really under underpinning this entire view that m somehow brain metabolism is a really important part to uh, epilepsy and seizure control. Right. In his case, and I'm sure you agree, because he was so young when he started this diet and he was so young when he discovered he had epilepsy. In his case and many others that I've read, the young people do have a, a little bit of an advantage where they can become under control. 
Yeah, I, I think that that's, it's a, it's a good question. You're, I think you're asking whether a KD would be as effective in an adult as it is with a child. Yeah. Okay. And the, uh, the, 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 I think that there has been actually some small studies to that effect. Um, and the, the, according to those studies, they actually say that adult control is actually pretty good. The main problem, and it's a reality, reality bites type of problem, is that adults don't like the KD. Let's <laughs> no. face reality, it's, it's a high fat, you know, and, and what tastes good in, in your diet is usually carbohydrates, unfortunately. Right. So, so it is very difficult to keep an, uh, you know, you know a, a independent adult living on a high fat diet. It I mean, there, there, it doesn't have to be, it's, as it turns out, I don't think you have to have really, really high fat. Probably a moderate, just lower carbs is, is probably a key part of the seizure I improvement. And there has been some work done on that. Well, in my case, and this is decades ago, uh, I had to have a half a pint of heavy cream in every meal. Uh, it was into this thing called vegetables, which <laughs> when I was younger, really didn't care for them. And I had a limited amount of meat or seafood that I could have. It got to the point where even if I didn't want to drink the heavy cream, the doctor said, just make whipped cream out of it and eat it. So, but it's changed a, in a great way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, as I say, it's, it, it is, can be thought of as a modified Atkins. Right. Um, and that actually, as I say, does seem to work, uh, re does improve seizure frequency itself. So. That's good. Yeah. Any other testing that you do over at Yale that you'd like to tell people about? Sure. Um, we obviously are very interested in, in surgical, uh, surgical epilepsy for you know, determining where do the seizures actually come from. But we are also very interested in um, problems of drug effect. Um, and for example, uh, another aspect to the metabolic imaging is that we can actually make measurements of GABA, which is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter in the human brain, as well as glutamate, which is the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. And so we are very interested to understand how, for example, drugs the anti-epileptic medications that all our patients need to take um, is actually altering how this balance between excitatory and inhibitory uh, transmitters work and exactly where in the brain that actually happens. And so we actually have a number of um, projects geared towards that kind of question. Um, and, and so at the same time, you can make measurements of such inhibitory transmitters. You can also look at the, uh, the, um, the mitochondrial or the energy aspects to seizures. And so we can actually make good, good interesting relationships between the energy issue uh, as well as uh, how the balance of the amino acids transmitters actually work. Now, um, definitely not a doctor like you, but when people ask me, the, one of the many things I tell them is that you should interact with your neurologist and your regular MD and ask them, based upon the medication that you're taking, based upon how many seizures you've had or had, you should see what tests are available to you as far as the different blood tests. Yes. Are there certain medications it doesn't matter that if you take a blood test it's not it's not going to be uh, shown? The large majority of seizure medications um, do have blood tests to 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 check if you will. Okay. Um, I think and that is uh, well that's an unfortunate reality in a sense but I think it reflects the fact that the brain you, you like the brain likes to see a, a relatively steady level of medicines in your body and your system and so that's why we find that it's useful to understand for any given patient where that level of blood te levels of those medications needs to be that's why unfortunately there are so many tests I would say that there are a few medications where blood tests are not involved mm -hmm. um, and they tend to be more quote unquote PRN medications such as Valium such as Ativan um, you don't you know, we don't typically obtain levels for those um, and for certainly something like um, you know, a high fat or a modified Atkins diet. You know, there's there are some tests you can order for that, but it's it's more a lifestyle issue right. um, of being able to try to stay to the stay to the path of eating the right thing.